последствие ще преминем към асистент Христо Кристе, който ще ни говори повече за свободата на движение на работници. И след това ще имаме така, удоволствието да ви представим отбора, който ще представи Софийския университет в Съцените по европейско право. А, ще използваме възможността да ви представим отбора, за да ви дадеме инициативата и по-скоро да ви покажем какво точно ние си представяме да се случи на 11 май като състезание. Те ще бъдат един вид а, образец на това, което ние сме предвидили като състезание за 11 май. Надяваме се да ви хареса и нека започваме! Okay, thank you and welcome to uh, my lecture and thank you very much for the invitation uh, from the Ujing Society. I, 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 my Bulgarian is kind of half not, not existent and so as a result I've got the odd thing like my name <laughs> and not very much else. But um, as uh, you probably indicated, um, we also organise the competition, the CEMC, so basically I'm interested in mooting as well as very much European Union law and we have had a relationship and undertaken a course in this university um, since about 1998, so it's a very long existing relationship. So I was asked um, by Alexander to talk a little bit about a particular case that has had a huge impact um, upon European law. Um, it's a case obviously in the very early days of the European economic community uh, but equally, I think it's also interesting for asking a common lawyer, because obviously I, I think most of you know the English, the Irish, the Americans, they have a different system of law, and therefore we are very in, influenced by and we have a large amount of respect for judge-made law. And so what I'm going to be looking at is a little bit of European judge-made law and its impact in relation to the development of the European system that we are all members of now. So let me just start by a little bit of introduction. Just to confirm what I've just been saying, the common law system, the English system obviously historically is the oldest, but the common law system basically starts by looking at practical reality situations. Our whole system develops from custom, Customs that effectively are used to enable you to resolve disputes. So in other words, you have a practical problem, you have two sides, and rather than looking at a code or some other set law, we instead look at what's the practical way of resolving those problems. So a large amount of our law comes from actual disputes, actual issues, um, and as a result of that, we actually are always looking at judges who tend to deal with and find those resolutions. So um, in relation to our system, we have two elements that I think if you've studied our system at all, you'll know something about common law and equity. Both of those, basically, the idea of common law is judge-made law, looking at practical situations, which effectively enable a development of an area of law which can take into account changes in practice, social conditions, and equally, you know, resolutions that are effective for the parties concerned. So if I give an example, our area of contract law, looking at basically contracts and how they're resolved, is pretty much 80% plus made by judges, taken from actual situations and made by judges, with a little bit of impact from our legislation to do with protection of the weaker parties, like consumers, and a little bit of an impact from the European Union who are doing the same thing, protection of weaker parties like consumers. So, but the majority of it is really developed through the commercial courts. And the commercial courts are looking for practical resolutions. And so therefore we are very familiar with and happy with, if I can say in that sense, the idea that judges have a particularly important role to play with development of law. If we look at that as a context, and we look at the European Union, whoops, gone back too far. <laughs> look at the European Union. Right in its very beginning, the idea of the European Union, the European Economic Community, if we start there, there were three treaties, but I'm just taking the core out of that, was this idea of the common market, yeah? the idea of what's called the four freedoms, the ability to move, capital, um, and also people and goods, 
the idea that effectively you can cross the borders, you can take advantage of um, the market in other countries, but you can equally also move if you are professionally qualified, you can use your skills in another country as well with certain criteria. So the idea of the four freedoms was set up in the first of the treaties back in 1950s. And in that treaty that was agreed by the six original member states, those six original member states are all civil law based countries. There's no common lawyers here at the moment. We waited and we waited and we thought, is it okay? Is it working? Okay, we'll join. I'll come back to that later. But in relation to our system, basically the idea was 10 years, you have a common market. Sounds great, so by 1960, in place. Now, the reality is, that doesn't happen. And so what I want to identify is why it doesn't happen. Well, the first big issue, and this is an issue for some countries more than others, is the idea of supremacy. It's the idea of, you know, what is this new idea, this new treaty? Is it something where we're centralizing towards something federal? Or is it something where it's simply an agreement, bilateral, between countries where we'll have trade and economic benefits? Well, the theory is, if you think about things like free, four freedoms, and you think about the idea of free movement of people, people sounds about people, doesn't it? What's the point of saying free movement of people if it's an intergovernmental treaty? But the trouble with those things, and maybe this will be explored by the speaker who follows me, is the idea that these kind of general rights, these concepts, sound lovely in theory, but maybe are not quite so attractive when you examine them in practice. What I'm thinking of there, and some countries have seen this more than others, is the idea that you get things made in the cheapest country. So in other words, you move to the country where the cheapest labor takes place, set up a business there. I'm thinking of car manufacturers who did this quite a lot in the very beginning. They moved to the cheap country, cheap labor, and that meant their profit they could actually sell. And, but the problem for the country they really came from, the original country, is where are they paying the taxes? So the idea effectively of service movement is, I am based in one country, there is where I pay my taxes, I will provide services to another country, but for the other country, I compete with them. They are home market. And so in that situation, for that other country, I'm taking their business, and I'm not investing in their taxes. So that's not necessarily as good for the people. If you think in relation to also professionals, you basically, <laughs> effectively, if you're qualified and you have a very good skill and your salary in your own country isn't as good as a salary in another country, you move. We call that the brain drain, nice terms. The brain drains out of your country and basically it arrives in the other country. So in other words, what I'm saying is, for governments, whoops, the computer stopped working. <laughs> for governments, and it has stopped working actually. <laughs> Help. I'll keep talking. <laughs> but for governments, oh no, it's coming back. I think this idea is probably going to go to sleep if I can use it. Maybe. <clears throat> so for governments, basically, uh, the idea of four freedoms is a nice theory, which in practice is not always as nice. So what we have following that is this idea that they create the treaties, um, but what they have in relation to their agreement of the European Economic Treaty is the idea that we have to then put the detail. And what we're talking about there is the difference between primary legislation and secondary legislation. So you have the primary rights, and then you need the detail to say, how do they work? Put them into practice. Now, as I said before, when you have the political idea that maybe these ideas are nice in theory and not so nice in practice, then you need also, in the very beginning of the European Union, you need the idea of unanimity. In other words, the first six countries, everybody has to agree to everything. And if they don't agree, nothing happens. So you have something that is labelled the empty chair policy. I don't know if you've come across that already, but the idea is this. If one country doesn't want to do anything, they just don't turn up. And that means the ones who are left 
five countries are there, can not agree anything because they're missing somebody in that sense. And so that meant that for the first 10 years, this theory of freedoms didn't happen because one country, I don't know, does anyone know the country that missed most of these? France. Countries? Dear old France missed most of it. You know, they're our closest neighbors. Whenever they're your closest neighbors, you have this love-hate relationship with them. So France is, okay, they're fine, but they're also next door. So France missed. And that meant, therefore, all the detail wasn't present. So if we add to that as well the other issue, and the other issue is, what is the treaty about? Is the treaty about member states? Or is the treaty trying to create rights for people? Should people be able to use these rights? I think now, looking at it from the very modern future, you say, well, it's about people. Rights for persons. That's people. So surely it should be about people. But of course, in the very beginning, that was not quite so obvious. So what we actually have is, we have, it depends on where you live as to what rights you have. Because some countries have put those rights into practice, and other countries haven't. And so what we have is no common market, no common agreement, but basically the odd place where people are able to exercise those rights. And so, Judy will get there eventually, and so that is basically in the situation whereby we then come to, sorry, which is the worst thing about the uh, <clears throat> we then come to the situation of how does the motor start again? We have what we can call stagnation for 10 years because we agree it but nothing happens. So what starts everything moving towards the, the present European Union? And the answer is two things. Firstly, great we've got the slides back again. <laughs> Firstly, we have the Commission. <laughs> so what we have is basically, we have a very active president of the Commission, a guy called Jack Lenore, and he has this idea of how to start the motor up. And how does he do it? He does it in a number of ways. He basically says, when it comes to the single market, let's forget about unanimous voting, because obviously by this time, you've got more countries coming in. And so the whole idea of unanimous voting becomes even more difficult than it was before. So let's forget unanimous voting, let's go for what's called qualified majority voting. And the majority voting means it's going to be easier to agree. Secondly, he's going to have a timetable and they rename it, they re basically advertise it. It's now not the common market, it's the single market, the internal market, the single market. So therefore, let's start again. So the Commission are active, the Commission are committed, and they are going to help. But as my original indication was, it's not just the Commission, it's the court. Now the court, let's actually just think for a minute, who is the court? Let's get closer to it. Who is the court in this case? Well the court in this case are six, initially, unelected, of course, judges nominated by their country. So their country says, we put him forward, we put him forward. So what we actually have is, we have a problem because the actual member state governments can't agree, and six judges think this makes no sense. And that is why the case of Van Hend, the one I mentioned at the very beginning, is so important. It is now about to, um, what, it just, just basically celebrated its 50th birthday, but it effectively is something which has had a huge impact in relation to the development of European law. It has led, as I will say later, to judges being called activists, legislators, judicial legislation. The idea being that it's basically the judges who have created law. Was that their role? Is that something that is justifiable? And that's basically what we're looking at. So if we just return for a minute to remind you of something, how I'm presuming, have all of you done some European law? Has, okay, let me rephrase that question. Has anybody not done European law? Okay, so a few, right, in that sense. So very briefly as a context, it's just a kind of reminder of the European structure. You have the treaty articles, primary legislation, 
And then you have secondary legislation, and it's the secondary legislation I was just talking about. The legislation that needed unanimity and which was not being passed. We have something called regulations. Now regulations tend to be technical standards, things that are basically about technical structures, normative things, things that will basically impose and work automatically. The one that is the usually most problematic one, the one that brings the rights that I've just been talking about for people into place in particular, is directives. Directives are described as a harmonizing measure. And that means basically you're going to have a bit of choice. A bit of choice about how you do it. Sometimes a bit of choice about whether you do all of it. In other words, it may be partly optional for some elements of it, like some defenses in that sense. You then have decisions and opinions, which for our purpose today are not particularly important. Um, and then I just mentioned that nowadays we have also other kinds of legislation. And those other kinds of legislation talk about modern times. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> modern times. Yeah, okay. Do I want it to make broad changes? No. Okay. <laughs> Just in case. All right. So, some other kinds of legislation, because we have later developments in European Union, which are still developing now, and which are politically sensitive. Things like your internal political situation, justice and home affairs, or things like the common defence scenario. They're a little bit more politically sensitive, so there's other types of voting structures applicable to them, one of which um, is the framework decision. But let's just go back to the courts. So we have the Court of Justice, as I said, one member nominated by each member state. Six, nine, 12, 27, basically, 28 coming. <laughs> So we have one member, and this is the court that we're talking about, who's going to have the impact. Now, nowadays, we also have to be aware, if you think about that, think of the population of the EU, and think about one member with a cabinet, a basically working chambers, of three or four people. There's no way they can deal with all of this, is there, realistically? So in other words, there's a partnership idea. And the partnership is the court and the national courts. So the national courts are going to input into what's happening in EU law by enforcing, basically, the EU law principles. But then, more recently, not important for our purposes, the courts are developing. So the starting point, really, of the courts is, if we look at the Court of Justice, if it's going to make change, it needs a vehicle. It needs a way of doing this. And the way of doing this is something called the preliminary ruling procedure. And the preliminary ruling procedure is basically saying, when you have communities and lots of member states, the member states' courts cannot interpret something that is European. Because if they do, you're going to have different interpretations, depending upon your own system. So instead, we need a court that interprets and applies throughout the EU. So the idea of the European um, preliminary ruling procedure is a cooperation between the National Court and the European Court of Justice. So it works this way. I am not sure what this article means. I ask you, European Court, to tell me what this article means. You tell me, it comes back to me. I then use that interpretation to apply the law in practice to the facts of the case before me. So in other words, what we clearly have is a distinction between who interprets and who applies. The national courts apply, the European court interprets. But the idea so far, it sounds like a cooperation. You know, the idea, I ask, you re re reply with your interpretation, I deal with it, end. And, and no doubt, if you look at the original wording of the treaty article, which was, as you see, it's changed its numbers, which is very complicated. It started at 107, 77, it then became 234, it's now 267. It's the same article with a slight adaptation. But the idea is, according to the way it was drafted, that is the end of it. So every time, it's a bilateral relationship. You ask the question, as a court, it comes back to you with an answer, you deal with it in practice. Now, the courts of the European court itself 
basically, immediately looked at that and thought, that is a waste of time. Because if we have to keep answering the same question, and there's only six of us, we're going to keep asking and answering the same question, and we're going to have time to do nothing else. Now, in the English system, we have, because judges make law, remember, we have something called precedent. And the idea of precedent is, if you give an answer, it applies to the whole system. And it becomes law. And so therefore, everybody below you follows it. It's a very efficient method, effectively. And the court, in the European court, adopt something similar. They start to develop an idea whereby, if we actually get asked a question and we give an answer, don't come to us and ask the same question again. Because <laughs> we don't need the answer twice. So basically, if the answer is there, use the answer. Which for common lawyers sounds a little bit like precedent creation. Which is why, obviously, you know, as I said, for our system this is not strange. But I have to say, this is starting to happen before we become members. So this is civil court judges who are doing this. We become members in the 1970s. In the 1970s, it's becoming much more normal, and we help, because we're very happy about this idea. So we join in as part of the judges and the advocate generals who do this. Now, the thing, as far as the court is concerned, is so far, this is basically being made a more efficient article, because it's giving the court more chance to have a say. And obviously, what they want to do is to have a say which has an impact. And I'll come back to that bit later on. But the, the other thing is about whether anybody asks them questions. Because the other problem you have, if you look at this article, is there is what I call the may and the must court. The may court is, yes, you can ask the question if you want to. The must court is, yes, you have to ask the question. And the idea of the must court is, when you get to the court against which there are no appeals, that court must ask the question of interpretation of European law. But if you're in a lower court, well, they can avoid the question by thinking, let's let them appeal. When it gets to the highest one, let them ask the question. Or they can ask the question. Now, again, if you think about most national systems of courts, the idea that the lower court will jump the higher court and go straight to Luxembourg is probably not very popular. <laughs> and so therefore, in that system, basically, you know, you're going to have this kind of idea that the senior judges are going to think, mm, let's discourage them doing that. But let's also think practically, let's think practically and say, if you waited until you get only the courts that are in the appeal courts to ask questions, you won't get many questions. Because if you think about most court structures nationally, the number of cases that get that high are quite small in number. And so as a result, the Court of Justice will not have as much activity possibility. So what we have is what's called the welcome courts, one and all. And you can almost say it's almost like a social program political idea, where the Court of Justice in Luxembourg basically says, come and look at us, come and see who we are, see how useful we can be, so you're more happy to ask us questions. And so you have quite a lot of lower level courts asking questions. Now, if you put those two things together, you've got questions coming from lower courts, all through the European communities. You have a court at the top that is saying, when we give you an answer, it applies everywhere. You can start to see the vehicle for the court to have influence in the European community is getting faster. And it's getting better, more efficient. And that's the starting point of the case of Van Hend. Now, Van Hend starts to talk about two issues. But the first issue is supremacy. Now, again, I'm sure all of you know, there is nothing in the treaty articles, specifically in the main treaty of European Union, in the main articles, that says supremacy. And there never has been, except in one document, the Constitution. And what happened to the Constitution? The problem is, 
We call, it, it being the English system, we have a system where sovereignty basically is very important for us. We have an unwritten constitution and parliamentary sovereignty is fundamental to our system. So using the word supremacy, if you were an English politician, there is a nice phrase in England called a hot potato. It's like having a hot potato. You want to throw it so somebody else catches it because you do not want to have it in your hands because you won't be elected again, basically. So in other words, the idea of supremacy for us is horrendous if you are a politician. But I think we're not alone in that sense. But the issue is basically here, you do have these constitutional differences. And the idea in some countries is that international law as a status, it does have elements of supremacy. So many countries do have that inbuilt in their system. We definitely don't, and there are other countries that also don't. And so when they're starting the development, the idea of supremacy is something which is always very key, very difficult. But if you come on to that and think a bit further about it, you'll also be aware that you can't avoid the question. Because if you want to try and achieve uniformity of rights wherever people live, that's a very key issue, isn't it? If one country says, yes, it's supreme, and another country says, no, it's not, there's no uniformity. So supremacy is something that has to be dealt with. And at the very beginning, who deals with it? The court. Now, that is going to be highly controversial for varying reasons. But the obvious reason is, if the politicians don't say it, why should the court be able to say it? And so we're going to have a kind of, a little bit of a battle between the European court, who are convinced the only way is supremacy, and the national courts, who are not quite so convinced, and who remain slightly unconvinced in part, and depends, and it actually hasn't been helped perhaps, by the fact of what's been happening recently. In other words, a very large enlargement has obviously made the countries and their disparities very much more different. So what I've tried to do there is just basically show you the idea of what would happen with supremacy and what this case of Van Hend will actually um, bring in. And it is the idea that supremacy EU law, treaty articles, as against national law in every member state will depend upon their constitution, their national law, and therefore it will vary. And because treaty articles will vary, even more so is that going to depend when it comes to secondary law, the directives, the regulations, etc. So supremacy is going to be something very difficult to achieve. So let's come back to this case. The heritage is called of Van Hend. What's Van Hend all about? It's a very boring case. <laughs> it's a very boring case factually because it's about classification of customs duties. So exciting. Yeah? But the thing in relation to Van Hend is that it's basically a very simple issue. And the issue is there is an EU rule that says we classify customs duties. And you, as a member state, cannot change that. So it's a negative rule, basically. It's saying the rule is the EU. It's not for you, as national countries, to change that classification. Now, in Holland, Mr. Van Hend has exactly that happen to him. He says, they changed the classification. I'm paying more. And I shouldn't pay more. Because EU law says, this is my classification. And he goes to his national court. Well, actually, it's a tribunal. It's quite low. It's a customs tariff tribunal. So it's not in any way a high judicial structure. But they are kind of courageous and say, let's ask the question. So they ask the question at the European Court of Justice. Now, as I said before, the European Court of Justice have been creating this vehicle, including the case of Van Hend. And what they're going to say is basically, well, this is a very good way of looking at this very important issue, supremacy. Now, the way that the Article 267 procedure works is that it actually takes account of different member state problems, and it takes account of economic issues, 
and it takes account of political issues. In other words, when you actually have a case before the European Court, you'll have the parties arguing, but you'll have the political representatives as well. In other words, you'll have the Commission, they're the EU people, and then you'll have each member state who will say, no, yes, I agree, no, I don't agree. Interventions from the Euro each member state is quite possible because it's basically giving the flavour for the European Court of all the issues, the problems that they should take account of. And so in this case, you've got six countries who draft the treaty, the original six countries. And they're coming and they're saying to the court, no, <laughs> we didn't draft this, no. <laughs> The Advocate General, now what we have here is we have an Advocate General is another lawyer appointed to help the court. The Advocate General role is to basically research, advise, give a suggestion as to what the answer should be. For us, they're very like the English judges, because the English judges have to justify everything they say, argue it through, show the right reasons, the bad reasons, and basically say, therefore. So in effect, this is a bit like the Advocate General. The Advocate General says, what a nice idea. But I don't think you can do it in practice. So in other words, what you actually have is you have the people, the countries who've created it, the treaties, say, no. The advisor saying, mm, don't think so. What do the courts say? Yes. It's clear. OK. <laughs> clear where? So they've got to find reasons for this. And the reasons they find, you'll see the first reason, spirit, aim, new legal order. Obviously, when you talk about that, does that sound very legal terminology or does that sound more political terminology? But that's what they're basically saying. They say, when you look at it, it's going to be clear. They then move on and they say, and not only is it clear, basically, but the next case, the case called Costa, so Van Hend is starting up the scenario, says they've also created their own institutions. If you create your own institutions, you intend to limit your sovereignty. So supremacy is clear. We keep going. But um, I'm, a, I'm a lower court judge. I've got national law that says this. I've got EU law that says this. I can't change my national law. What do I do with the national law when it conflicts? It's okay. Disapply it. So, avoid it, <laughs> basically. And then we have the last case, and this happens in England. This is the case about Spanish fishermen in England called Factotain. And they basically want a remedy because they're saying the English government has breached their rights. And we don't have a remedy nationally if you sue the state. So we go to the European Court and the court says, create one. So what you can see, see basically is a European Court, and let's remember who these people are. We're talking, as you can see, we've got 1960s, whoops, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, all saying supremacy, supremacy, supremacy. Now, if you just remember what I said a bit earlier, the trouble is they're only a small body. They're not actually in each of the member states. So it's all very well what they're saying, but if the member states don't agree and don't do it, it's empty words, isn't it? Because going back to the original articles, there's nothing about supremacy in the original treaty articles. So in other words, what they have to do is convince the national courts. Because if they convince the national courts, it's the national courts who apply this, it's the national courts who have the procedure. Now for us, therefore, this whole idea of primacy, of supremacy and primacy, is something which is very fundamental because, as I said before, we are a duality system. We are a system where international law is international law. It's out there. It's not in here. And it only becomes our law, irrespective of what we've signed in treaties, it only becomes our law when we make it our law, when we implement it nationally. So the idea of supremacy, meaning we take this foreign law, we bring it in and automatically apply it and we disapply our law, is very problematic for a system like ours because of the way international law is treated. And so it's not surprising that own not only our system, but other systems 
Particularly governments, and this is particularly true of the English government at this precise moment, do not like the idea of the court doing this. And that's why the, the court is called activist. And so what we are now have is we have, I've mentioned those two cases, Van Hend and Factor Dame, but I've also put out what is now said in the treaties about primacy. It's not in the treaty, it's attached to it. It's a declaration. And the declaration says, the council recalls that in accordance with well-settled case law, the judges, basically, um, the treaties and the law adopted by the Union have primacy, read that as supremacy, over the law of member states. So let's basically put that into context. What we're actually saying there is that if you actually look at the system, the member states cannot agree the wording, so they can't put it in the treaty. But it's been happening in practice. And it's been broadly accepted in practice because the European court has created the idea and the national courts are applying the idea. And so therefore, they're basically saying, we're not changing anything. We're not putting it in there, but we're not changing anything. Now, again, that's gonna create vast differences in member states. Our system, the UK, take the view, we joined in 1970s. In 1960 is the case of Van Hend. We knew what we were entering, and we basically accepted it. It's problematic for us to now say something different. But of course, that's going to change, and particularly it's going to change in other member states if there seems a clash between the constitution of that state and the EU law. Now, one of the cases I've mentioned there, the one in the middle, is Germany. And Germany basically had this problem in the 1990s. And the reason they had this problem was a very logical one. It was to do with human rights. And basically, constitutions clearly protect human rights. And the EU was an economic community. And so basically, if you didn't protect, if you actually have an interpretation which is purely economic, human rights are not going to be protected. And so they said, we can't do this, because we have to protect human rights. Now, as you may know, in the 1990s, the Maastricht Treaty, the first treaty of European Union, brings in human rights. And so the Germans say, okay, those of you who speak German will know the first word, so lange aus, as long as, you don't get carried away, court, we're okay with that. But watch out, we're keeping an eye on you. And that is pretty much their attitude today. Germany is basically saying, as is Italy, that, you know, we're okay with this, but we're watching out, don't get carried away. So, modern times. I've mentioned there a Polish constitutional court judgment. Um, and obviously, like yourselves, Poland is a new member. They've joined much more recently than Germany, etc., and ourselves. And their view is, there's no way the constitution can be basically under um, EU law. So they're coming and they're saying, well, what are they saying? They've signed the treaty, they've signed the declaration, but they're saying the constitution is still supreme in our country. So you, you can see the issue is very live still, but the way it's come at all is the court. It's Van Hend. That's the reason why Van Hend is so celebrated and feared, if I can put it that way as well. Let's see what else Van Hend did. Now you remember I said, the other big problem is no secondary legislation, yeah? Which means you've got lovely rights in theory, nothing in practice because you haven't got the directives you need because they can't agree, because they haven't got empty chair, unanimity. There's a problem anyway. Well, Van Hend is the case, same judges, same case, that say, no, this is actually there for the people. This is a treaty for people as well as for governments and therefore it's creating rights for people. And so what we want to do is we want to achieve the possibility that the people, the citizens, will be able to rely upon European law directly before their national courts. So that's the other thing that Van Hend is well renowned for. And we call that direct effect. That's the English word because translations, different things happen. But the English version is direct effect. And, and those of you who have done European law, I'm sure know that direct effect, the courts say, have a number of conditions. 
The first condition is, look at the particular measure of concern. Is it intended to create individual rights? If it's intended to create individual rights, and if those rights are clear and unambiguous rights, and if there is no conditionality, in other words, the need for detail, the, the possibility of saying it will not happen until, and if there is no requirement for further action, then why not be able to rely upon that directly before your national court? Now let's remember those boring facts of Van Hend. All that Van Hend was asking was, which one is supreme? In other words, if you look at, you cannot reclassify customs duties, that's the article. Is that clear? I think so. <laughs> is it unambiguous? Definitely. Is it conditional? No. Does it require explanation? No. So therefore, yes, you can use it before your national court, basically. That's the idea of direct effect, that an individual can use European law that maybe hasn't been properly implemented or fully implemented by the EU in their national system before their national court to exercise those rights. I think you can start to see why Van Hend is both celebrated and in some countries not so celebrated. So let's actually have a look at it this way. As you can see here, what you have really is the idea, if we look at the treaty articles and we look at the regulations, we have another phrase that we use in England, and I can't see it's often translated, but the idea is the same, and it's the phrase of direct applicability. And it's the idea that when you make this law, it is automatically national law as well. Treaty articles are automatically national law. Regulations, normative, are automatically national law. You cannot rephrase them, you cannot do anything with them. As soon as they're passed and they've gone past the time, they're national law. So if you combine that with what we just said, you can see that if you are talking about direct effect, as long as it satisfies those conditions, if it's a directly applicable measure, it's automatically available to you in your national court. Yeah? But if you remember from what I said earlier, the legislation which is most problematic is not the regulation, it's the directive. And the directive, well, it's a harmonizing measure. So the idea is you bring it in to your system. So if you look at my diagram, you can see the first two, EU law and national law at the same time. The directive, EU law outside the system, in our system at least, and national law, well yes, if you implement it nationally. So as we can see, we're going to have a big issue here, aren't we, about supremacy and being able to use that law. But before we go on to that, let's also introduce you or, or deal with another term, and that is the idea that we call vertical and horizontal direct effect, which you may have come across already. But what we've just been talking about is Mr. Van Hen was suing his state. And when you sue your state, there is a general idea the state should be putting EU law into place. That's their agreement, they should be doing it. And if they don't, well, you should be able to sue them, basically. So that's the idea of, whoops, the wrong way. That's the idea of vertical direct effect. An individual using EU law to sue their state. Much more problematic, as you can see, is the idea, can you use direct effect not only to give rights to individuals, but to impose responsibility on individuals? Negativity, I suppose. And there, the idea here is basically individual against individual. And the concept is that of horizontal direct effect, where you use EU law to basically rely um, before a national court on the case that is being made against another individual. Now, from what I've just said, you perhaps will realise that law that is directly applicable and is also national law for that reason, why not? Because there's a general idea, isn't there, in most cases, that you, know, you should know the law. And this law is your national law because it's directly applicable law. And so therefore the case that confirms that is a case called Dufresne, but the idea is the same. If you satisfy the conditions, 
which is clear and ambiguous, unconditional, and basically not discretionary. You can sue an individual, you can sue the state, both are possible in that scenario. Let's move on a bit further though. What about that problematic area, which is the directive? Now the problem with the directives, as we said, you're going to have a lot of difference in member states. Some member states are going to put it in, some member states are not going to have put it in. And so therefore, can you also use direct effect with regard to the idea of directives, even if they've not been implemented? The case that's important here is a case called Van Dyne. It's an English case from the 1970s, and it's a case to do with a nice Dutch lady who wants to work in England. Um, and she wants to work for somebody who the English don't like which is the Church of Scientology. So the Church of Scientology basically is unpopular, but it's not illegal. So she wants to come to England. Well, as you all, I'm sure, know, treaty article, free movement. Yeah? So free movement treaty article, yes, come. Oh, wait a minute, free movement treaty article, there's this one that says, unless we don't want you, public policy, public security, public health, or whatever it happens to be. And yes, they said, Church of Scientology, we don't want you. So in other words, she could use the article, but so could they. So she can come in and they can say, no. But there's a directive, there's second legislation, which basically says, but you can't, as a member state, just say no. You have to be able to justify this. And it has to be based upon your personal conduct. Now that's in a directive, and it's not implemented in England. So therefore, she wants to rely on that and say, they can't refuse me. I've done nothing wrong. But we haven't got the law. But who is she suing? The government. Why haven't we got the law? Because the government haven't implemented it. So basically, she is trying to sue based upon something that the government agreed to, but didn't implement. We have a principle in the UK which is called estoppel. <coughs> and estoppel is the idea that you can't use your own fault to stop somebody exercising a legally available right. So what we're talking about here is that concept, that it's the government's fault, they can't use that fault to stop her exercising her right. So let's go back to that directive and look at the Van, the Van Henge test. Is personal conduct clear and unambiguous? I think so. So do they. Is it unconditional? Uh, directives are not unconditional, are they, automatically? Because you have a period and you have a right to implement. Well, the way they dealt with that is that basically you have a right, but only until the period to implement the directive basically terminates. At the end of that period, the law should be there. So it's conditional until the period expires. So that's okay, we can deal with that condition. Is it dependent upon further action? Well, do you need legislative intervention? Again, the other idea is it's the same thing. Effectively, you've lost your right, your discretion, by not doing it in time. That's your fault, your problem, and you can't use that against her. So the courts say that it is possible to have vertical effect, so you can sue the state. But there's another big issue, isn't there? And that is the issue, what about horizontal? So what we're really saying is, can you use unimplemented European law, which doesn't exist in your national law, not only to give rights, but to impose liability? Which is a very much bigger step. And the problem with that step is, for the national courts, it's a little bit of a step too far. Because the national courts are rebelling. They're basically saying, I'm not so sure about this. I don't think it's appropriate to basically impose. It's okay to give rights against the state. It's not so okay to impose rights. In other words, what we have is, we have a problem. Because if you remember what I said at the beginning, I said in relation to that preliminary ruling, but the difficulty you have is the national courts have to ask questions, they have to cooperate, and they are also the enforcers of EU law. So if you lose their support, you have a problem in your creation of your vehicle. 
it's going to start slowing down. It might even stop. Okay? So if we look at that situation, there is a reason why the court is going to have to think twice. And the court think twice, but they come to the idea, let's go for a compromise. We're still in England. You see, the English ask questions. And they give you the vehicle to be able to give answers. And the question that comes is a case called Marshall. Now, Marshall is a very famous lady in the English system. She's a very famous lady because she was someone who took a number of cases to the European court. She retired, and then she started a new career. And her new career was, let's go to the European court, basically. So she has a number of cases which actually are really very useful and which are helpful in developing law. This is her first one. And her first problem is, she doesn't want to retire. <laughs> And she basically says, why as a woman do I have to retire at one age and men can retire later? Now I know most women tend to go, well that's actually fine to be honest, but Mrs. Marshall, no way, that's not fair. So she was saying equal treatment, I am not being treated equally, discrimination. But the reason why this case is great for the purpose of um, the development of the Van Hand idea is this, because if you look at the idea of Marshall, what you have is a case where the court who asked the question described the defendant, and the de defendant here is an area health authority, so a local health authority, but with public funding, as a public body. If you say the word public body, they sound like state, don't they? So in other words, what this case gives is the compromise possibility. It gives the possibility of saying, hey, we can compromise, and we can actually have a way of pushing the rule further, but of then looking for another way of developing the idea of equality, uniformity of rights. This is sounding to you, I'm sure, a little bit like a mission statement. And I think there's definitely an argument that the court has a mission. And the mission they have is equal rights to everybody in whatever country you live in. And they're trying to achieve it through this mechanism. The court is much bigger now. We joined it. <laughs> And so have others. So we're nine, moving on to 12, basically. More countries involved, but the same idea, and all of the judges are still involved, which is slightly different to the system we have nowadays. And so therefore, what they do is they say, yes, vertical, but vertical and the person you're suing is not just a state, it's something called an emanation of the state, which is basically a public body. And if they're a public body, it's the same as the government, sue them. But, and you see here, of course, it's quite clear you cannot impose responsibility from directives upon individuals. They don't really mean that. <laughs> they're just simply saying it because they're obviously having to justify the decision. Because what have they done? They found another way. So what we see is, therefore, directives, according to the case law, and it's still the judges doing all of this, vertical, yes. And that includes something called emanation of the state. Horizontal.